Now, first thing, when you come to uh, mystockodds.com, uh, you'll see the home page and the dashboards are accessible under the features. We've got dashboards. You can go down and view uh, the different dashboards. The seasonality almanac is free for everyone. Um, this is part of our freemium offering to get people to experience uh, the data and um, you know see that there is some value there. I uh, had a lot of great feedback on um, you know how this has helped for trading context. Uh, regardless of your time frame, you might be a short-term trader or a long-term trader. I'm just going to pull this one up uh, since we're on the subject. Uh, we can go to, for example, uh, what happened in, in July here. And um, we're in August now, but I just want to review just quickly uh, with July. So these were some of the symbols that, uh, you know, were performing the first day of the month. And in the drop down, you have different events and different time frames that you can choose from. And so when we take a look at, you know, monthly, these were some of the symbols that were supposed to perform um, better and some that were supposed to perform worse on a probability basis. I just want to review uh, quickly here the, the next page. By clicking on this, you move to the next page. And this gives all of the different events that are in that uh, drop down um, displayed in this fashion here. Um, so it's a good starting point. And you can see that uh, for the Mondays in July, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, that's the uh, average performance. Our database is based on close to close performance for these time frames, as well as uh, we go back a maximum of 10 years. So there might be some symbols that you're dealing with that are, haven't been around for 10 years. So we can only display uh, that qual quantity of data. But um, anyway, this is it. You know, we're not going back to 1950 or whatever. We're we're focusing on the last 10 years because it's the most relevant to how market conditions have been, you know, the actions of the Fed and things like that, uh, that have all played into, um, you know, these last 10 years. So it is relevant. And if I was looking at a 50 year sample anyway, I would tend to wait uh, the last number of years. So for July, we had an expectation on the SPY of 2.7%. Well, July finished at 2.44%. So almost on target. In fact, on the Thursday before the last trading day of the month, which you can look here, the last trading day of the month was expected to be slightly down. Um, we were at uh, 3.18 intraday. Um, and so uh, I told some of the traders that uh, we're a little bit uh, rich in terms of the performance uh, for uh, July so far, plus coming into the last trading day of the month is expected to be a down session. So expect that to pull back towards the 2.7%, and it pulled back a little bit more and closed at 2.44. Um, so I find that the seasonality almanac is extremely helpful for context, and you can go then into the month of August, and we can see that you know this is the performance for the days of the week, and this is the performance expected for the IWM, which is the Russell 2000 ETF, or the SPY, which is the S&P 500 ETF. Um, this is the performance expected first trading day of the month, first Friday of the month. We're already outperforming you know, that first day. So, so the market is tending to be a little bit more bullish right now than, than what the data says. As we approach mid-month seasonality, um, that, this is gonna be interesting to me because if the market holds up pretty well, and we see some signs of it uh, uh, cracking, that mid-month seasonality underperformance could be especially attractive. Um, then when, as we come into the third Friday of the month, uh, it's expiration on a monthly basis. It's not a significant event. You have a lot of people, uh, institutions and investors that are away for the month of August. They're just not participating much in the market. So expect liquidity be less and so on. The last five trading days of the month uh, include the last three and the last day of the month as well, but that's expected to be more robust. Um, and the performance for uh, the month of uh, August isn't too bad when you take all things considered here at 0.7. Uh, so it's not 
historically a down month. It's just not one of the best performing months. Starts out a little bit uh, softer and, um, and, and moves on uh, to close better near the end of the month. So you can type in here any symbol that you want. You can compare this to say, okay, um, I want to put in uh, the oil, integrated oil ETF. So you can type that in, hit enter. And this gives you a great comparison here of one of the sector ETFs, which is XLE, energy sector ETF, against the SPY. So again, the SPY is still that 0.7 that we showed you before. Uh, but oil is expected to perform pretty poorly, you know, every day of the week, uh, as well as the first week of the month and mid-month seasonality and so on. It does pop up a little bit near the end of the month, but for the whole month, down minus 1.9%. And then over here, we, we kind of rank this um, and show you the events in this uh, tree here. So that'll be um, whatever symbol you type in, you'll see the top uh, eight seasonality signals by average per percent change. So a great, a great comparison in that we're standardizing it with a SPY, but also you can drill into any ETF that you want. You can also choose stocks here and decide you know, what kind of symbol. Maybe you want to look at it compared to Apple, which is uh, widely held and widely traded. And you say, how does Apple tend to do for August? Well, historically, Apple is, is an outstander, and it's already started this month you know, pretty well. So... I'm, I've been long, uh, in my own trading, I've been long Apple, um, you know, the last couple of days, and, and I'm using uh, its seasonality along with um, the odds that are produced from other indicators that you'll see in the other dashboards as well as the web screener. So, um, again, you can look at first trading day of the month, first Friday, mid-month, seasonality, third Friday. So, all of these different events here, you can see how any symbol that we have in our database, which uh, we cover most liquid uh, US listed stocks. Um, some things that might not be in here are things that IPO'd recently, um, maybe some of the SPACs, things like that uh, aren't in our database. So, uh, you know, we, we have the majority of the liquid um, uh, US listed symbols, but if you don't find something, you know, uh, it's just part of the universe that we have. Additionally, we are, we are curtailing a little bit of the total offering of stocks for the dashboards. Um, and then we offer everything through the web screener or through the API. Okay. So rolling back to the previous page, um, you can see for August on a monthly basis, some of the symbols we can also choose, you know, uh, for today, for Wednesday, for example, what was in focus. Um, incidentally, so some of these stocks here, uh, you know, are doing pretty well today in comparison to these. Um, and, and this is not, not, this is not a sniper approach. Uh, what it is, is you got to think of it in terms of a, a, a basket approach or a motif approach. It's not a sniper approach. So you're going to, if you just select one symbol out of the list, you know, it, it may work out, it may not work out. It's supposed to work out on a probability basis, but there's no guarantee. When you take more of a, a shotgun approach instead of the sniper approach, uh, you have that long capital working for you versus the short capital. Some people only want to trade long. Some people want to use it for swing trading, things like that. So uh, there's different approaches. Um, what we like to do is is we want our capital to work for us every day if we can. Like we want return on capital as frequently as possible. And I find by trading every day, it kind of smooths things out. If you get too picky and say, well, I'm gonna to trade today, but I'm not gonna trade tomorrow or whatever. When you, when you do that approach, you're adding a lot of extra discretion. And uh, we found it better over the years to just stay with the statistics uh, just lean on it and, and take that shotgun approach and it tends to work out better. If people are doing more of a, uh, a sniper approach, they might want to consider a pair. Like what's a good pair uh, with CZR if you wanted to do that? Or what's a good pair with Apple? Or what's a good pair with CRM? Um, and so that you have something else to look at, something to lean on, to hedge with if you need to. 
Alternatively, you can just use some ETFs and take that uh, swing trade approach. So again, this seasonality is based on what happened in the past from close to close. So for that Wednesday, for example, of August, these were all the Wednesdays in August aggregated, and these are the uh, symbols. This is the average performance here, and this is the odds. Now, the way that the dashboards work, including the Seasonality Almanac and the other vaults and reports that we have, is that think of it like 50 or better for the probability of that occurrence. So MTCH has odds of 60.9, so that's above 50. So the probability of that occurrence would be higher. If it was below 50, the probability of that occurrence would be lower, even though its outcome on average has been positive. That just means that there's been more events that have been like down sessions, but the events that have been up sessions have had greater performance, right? So that um, it produces you know, a discounted odds below 50, but favorable for performance. And if you put your mouse over, you can see uh, more details there. Okay, there's been 27 events, you know, it gives you the average performance and so on. And it also shows you the average percent change on the SPY. So uh, mousing over gives you a little bit more information. So on this side of the equation, the red color indicates down, down sessions on average and the amount of performance. And then this would be odds of that occurrence. So again, we're looking for odds to be greater than 50 for the higher probability of that occurrence. So Schlumberger, for example, one of my shorts that uh, I've been uh, utilizing. So I mentioned to you, I've been looking at Apple long and trading it long. Schlumberger would be from the short side. Um, so odds are 54.3 of a down session minus 0.62% on average. So that's just for this Wednesday. Now, the signals of the days of the week are not going to be as strong generally as when you dial into the third Friday of the month, the expiration, or the first Friday of the month, right? As you, as you roll into the turn of the month effect. Um, those types of signals are generally stronger than just any day of the week. But nonetheless, there are patterns to stocks for the days of the week, you know, based on um, just, there can be different, different types of players, different institutional activity. Um, there can be corporate actions. Um, there's just uniqueness sometimes to the way that stocks trade on any given day. Just no, no different than why a Friday, for example, would be uh, maybe more beneficial for defense contractors and less beneficial for media stocks because uh, people sort of, you know, move away from the media during the weekend. And uh, but we could have some geopolitical concerns or wars or whatever over the weekend. So there's there's a macro type of backdrop. And there's generally a reason for patterns to exist, no matter where you find them. And that's that's always the question is, OK, I see a pattern. Why might it exist? All right. Moving on, um, one more slide on the seasonality, which is the third page, just tells you, you know, what's happening. We're coming up to the first Friday of August. You know, what does it look like uh, for the different countries of the world if you want to trade, um, you know, for international returns and uh, look at different markets. In our database, we do have more markets than just the U.S., so in case you're interested. And sometimes that gives you uh, some help, like, for example, what's happening in Asia might, uh, you know, or what's happening in Europe might roll over to, towards us, okay? So um, moving on to the other dashboards, um, you have overnight edge vault. Uh, these, these types of vaults here are made for, um, you know, kind of on-demand type information. So for example, I use this one today, the Gap Bulletin. And you have to be a subscriber. The, the, the seasonality is for free, as we mentioned. But you have to be a subscriber to get the uh, rest of the bulletins here. And I use this for uh, Tupperware today because it was one of my shorts. 
And um, it was gapping up pre-market and it had earnings. So I don't, I don't mind, normally I'll take out earnings, but I don't mind trading some depending on where it is, how it's opening, that kind of thing. So Tupperware was one of my shorts based on just general statistics. And it was gapping up 10% pre-market. Well, we don't even have an incident of it doing that. So, um, you know, I, you know, you could put in 10, but you're not going to see it, right? So the, the, the greatest that we've had in, in its history here is um, gapping up six to seven. So the way that this gap bulletin works is what is the gap closed to open? So as we're coming to the open of the day session, the um, the gap was greater than you know seven percent. So I don't I didn't have data for it, so I'm I'm not really comfortable uh, trading it. Um, the most we had was it gapped up six to seven in the past, and it was slightly up day, um, but I don't have any data after that. So I, I just removed it and I didn't trade it. But that's what this is for: is you can type in your symbol for its gap close to open. So you might be just pre-market and seeing an indication and see where it's trading on ARCA, or you might be after the open and you want to say, hey, maybe I want to put this on my watch list. Maybe I want to trade it. Um, you can just uh, type in your symbol and see where it falls into uh, this statistical bin. So all of these divisions here are statistical bins and we've compiled that uh, bell curve here of of that to see how it uh, you know where most of them fall. So we have 707 that have fallen into very little change on the positive side, and 464 that have very little change on the negative side. But see, it's still a bit skewed to the positive side uh, over over history. Now, it gets really concerning down in here if it really gaps down a lot. We don't have a lot of events. We've only had three events in the bin of minus six to minus seven. We've only had five events in, in the last 2,000 day look back period. We've only had five events in the minus five to minus six. But if it was gapping down in that area, uh, that's enough information to me for, for me to not expect it to bounce that day. But there seems to be a sweet spot in between the minus three and the minus five. Uh, we have nine events on the minus four to five and uh, 13 events in the minus three to four. That gives me reason to be confident at the open, as long as it's within that range of minus three to minus five, I would be looking to buy it at the open or buy it after the open on a maybe a little bit more of a dip or maybe it starts moving up. But that would give me confidence because it's the close to open uh, you know, gap. And then the average uh, change on the day for open to close. So it's had, it's had an event or it's about to have an event. And I'm planning for how I want to trade it for the rest of the day. So again, it's open to close performance, 3.24%. Uh, and um, you know, that's happened. That's happened nine times in its in its 2,000 day look back. So obviously, the more events you have, the greater you can weight the information. If you only have one event, well, that's that's hard to make a a rational decision on how this thing is going to come out, right? But if you have, you know, 10 events, 15 events, 20 events, you're starting to get a bigger sample, and that can be very benef beneficial for you. So that's uh, one of the vaults. We also have a streak vault, which is um, you know, it's easier to understand, I think, when things move in one direction, how much is something streaked. So if you're looking at your uh, charts or something and you're saying, oh, look at that, that's gone up from close to close, you know, a certain amount of days in a row, and you can put that streak number in here, your symbol and your streak number, or slide the uh, the slider to find out uh, you know what bin it is in here. Um, you can also choose your output. You can say, okay, I want to look at it from open to close, or I want to look at it from close to close, or I want to look at it from close to close over the next three days. So, if for example, if Apple had moved 
up three day or down three days in a row is what is set for right now, uh, then the probability over the next three days from the close of the previous day, which is the last day of the streak, to the close three days from now uh, is positive 0.42%. If it streaks down five days in a row, uh, the probability even gets higher, right? Um, so here's the odds. We'll put mouse over here. Whoops, minus five. So this highlighted this here when I put minus five. So if we mouse over, we've got odds of being up 57.9. There's been 19 events where Apple has gapped down from close, or sorry, has streaked down on a close to close basis uh, in the last look back period, we've had 19 events where it's streaked in one direction five days in a row on a close to close basis. The average percent change after that out for three days is 1.48%. So we have 57.9 odds, so greater than 50, outcome 1.48%. That's a trade that I would be interested in. Um, if I saw that Apple had five days in a row where it streaked down on a close to close basis, I would be interested in that. Now, for some reason, when it streaks down eight, it's not so good, but notice that there's only one sample that it's ever done that. Okay, so the outcome of that one sample wasn't good, but you know, uh, the story, you know, if this happens more frequently, then we can have a more informed decision making. But for the most part, you know, stick with the with the higher samples. And um, and again, you get to choose open to close, close to close, or just close to close for three days. All right. So again, the uh, vaults are like that. Overnight edge vault is uh, if, if you're going towards the end of the day and you want to look at the performance and say, how is this going to possibly hold up overnight? Or are there any opportunity for overnight returns? That's what you would do, uh, would look at the overnight edge vault. Now, the reports, just based on limited time here, the reports are, are different in that they're not, they're not actionable like this. They're all based on, like the seasonality report that I showed you, is uh, let's go to RSI 2. RSI 2 is relative strength on a two period, okay? And the output that we chose was three days because not every one of our subscribers likes to trade every day. Many guys uh, you know, or many, many subscribers would like to trade multiple days. You know, they want to look at swing trades, things like that. So uh, we, we did a, a three-day projected return on the RSI 2. RSI 2 is simply relative strength, it's price-based. So we have, all of the reports look like this. You have four quadrants. You have trending up, trending down, bullish reversals, and bearish reversals. All right, so the first thing is that some of these quadrants give you more bang for your buck or actually have sort of higher probability outcomes than the other ones. So for example, what I found is that some of the bullish reversals, because you know, from a professional aspect, much of what we look at is sort of mean reverting trades, right? Yeah, we can, we can identify with trends and follow trends and work with them when they're there, but we're also looking for when things have the potential to reverse and give us that mean reversion. Because here's the thing, it's a lot easier to rely on numbers that, that have been than dealing with price discovery into new areas. So when something's making new all-time highs, it's actually more difficult to trade than when it's in a trading range and has many uh, data points to lean on. So um, I like the bullish reversals. And so this score here is the RSI value, RSI two, so two period, RSI value and uh, what it hit on that close of yesterday, for example. So this was down at the six number. And so that's that's quite a low RSI. Anything usually below 20 is considered, you know, even below 30 is, co is considered oversold. Now, now, the beautiful thing about stock odds, I'll just throw this in, is that 
it tells you what the subsequent performance after the RSI value. So we're not making a discretionary opinion on the RSI value. I don't really care what that number is. It doesn't, that number itself doesn't mean much to me because I wanna know that every time it's hit that number, what has been the subsequent performance after that? So yeah, that sounds pretty low. That sounds pretty over oversold, but what did it do next? So odds of being up 57.4, average percent change over the three days, 4.43%. So this could give you really great bang for your, your buck. There's been 54 events in Carvana's history of the last 2000 days that it's uh, performed to that extent over the three day period following when it fell into this statistical bin of that RSI. So that's, that's quite attractive. So the odds are 57.4, the average performance 4.43. It's a very attractive long. Now there's no guarantee, as we mentioned, this is all probability based. But can you imagine somebody uh, trading that just off an RSI value, making the assumption that it has to go up after being oversold? You can't make that assumption unless you have data to support it. Well, we have data. There's been 54 events and the average outcome for the three days following that event is 4.43. The bearish reversals are the opposite of that. Obviously looking for things to perform poorly. Um, and we don't often have as many shorts in our, you know, in our scope as we do longs because you're in a buy side market. You're in, you've been in a bull market for years. The whole industry is buy side. So you always seem to have more long ideas than you do short ideas. That's just the way it works. So I fill in, the capital to sort of neutralize that problem with ETFs, right? So, you know, it's like some great long stocks that have the probability of outperforming the ETF that they belong to. It, just imagine this for a moment. You have 500 stocks. Well, there's 506 total in the S&P 500, believe it or not. So you have, you have those 506 stocks. What if you could select 20 of them that had the high probability and exceptional performance to outpace the SPY for the day, for the three days, for five days, for 10 days, for the month? So if you can dial into that and you can have a number of symbols that you can utilize, you can either take trades right away or you can put them in a watch list or you can pair them off. But the point is, if you had 20 that could outperform the other 486, you know, that's a step in the right direction. And you could use the SPY as a hedge against that. So that's what I'm trying to do every day is curate some great long ideas. Some days it's only long against the ETF. And some days it's long stocks against short stocks, depending on how many short ideas that there are to be, uh, you know, to curated. So um, in this case here, you can see that the skew is the performance of the longs is much better than the performance of the shorts. But if this if this worked out, if you took all these longs and you took all these shorts and they performed, you know, as expected, you would have you would benefit from that that divergence. Essentially, you're making money on your shorts. You're making money on your longs. What the market tends to do is throw a monkey wrench into either your long ideas or your short ideas. So, for example, if you had all these longs selected here and the market sold off 10% today, I'll bet you that a lot of these would be under pressure and maybe only one or two would actually be green on the day, if that. When you look at a map of the market on a bad day, you can see that most sectors and most symbols are impacted. And the same would be true on a really bullish day. Most symbols are impacted. So there's a few outliers. 
That's why we like to combine long ideas and short ideas or long ideas with an ETF hedge or short ideas with an ETF hedge. Some days might be like that because it sort of takes that market out of it and you benefit then from your probability basis rather than from the outcome of the market, which is, which is truthfully beyond your control. Most uh, talking heads kind of seem to portray that they know what the market's going to do when really we should be humble and say we don't know what it's going to do. The best thing I've come up with is looking at seasonality and we've created, Stock Odds team has created the Stock Odds Almanac for you to give you that context that that backdrop behind everything that you do. And it really does pay off. Um, if you go to the next page of, of this, it just sorts everything into bins so you can see how frequently something occurs. It's just the diff diff distribution of the average performances and the distribution of the price bins. So that can be helpful as you drill into uh, cert, uh, symbols and um, get kind of a feel of things, okay? So there's some instructions on how to use it. Um, again, same principle applies here, is that odds better than 50, generally probability of this occurrence, okay? Odds better than 50, probability of this occurrence, okay? Now, because, because we have this website integrated with our Learning Academy and the dashboards, there is a different login. When you subscribe, you will receive two different emails. One is for the uh, login for mystockodds.com, the homepage, and being able to view all of the learning and uh, the dashboards and things like that, depending on your subscriber level. And the other one is for uh, this page here, which is stockodds.net. So this is our original web page for the database, and it continues to be how we log into the web screener. So we're going to log in here, so you can go to stockodds.net. So just remember, there's the two different websites, and uh, we're going to continue to find a way to integrate, but if not, that's just the way it is for now. You've got your login for mystockodds.com and your login for stockodds.net if you're subscribed to the web screener. So we can log in. And um, first thing you'll, you'll see is, is this page. And under the signals, we have, there's the RSI2 that we were just showing you in the dashboard. So this information should concur with what the dashboards say as well. The dashboard is a great visual way to see things, a great way to get ideas, actionable ideas, you know, all the time. You can just, you know, pop over, take a look at the dashboards and get your actionable ideas, especially if you're not, if you're not trading that many symbols. Uh, when you want to trade, you know, 100, 200, 300 symbols at a time during the day, if you have the capital to support that, um, you know, you really, maybe you're uh, trading for an institution or, or you're uh, a professional trader, has a lot of access to capital. Um, some of our traders that I work with uh, trade, you know, 250 to 300 longs against 200 shorts and some spy fill in or IWM. So large baskets. And if that's not where you're at, then that's not a problem. You can focus on just a few symbols and you're still, the beauty is you're still informed on a probability basis for the few. So uh, RSI 2 uh, is one of the indicators. Percent B is basically how close something is where it falls relative to its lower Bollinger Band or its upper Bollinger Band. And Bollinger Bands are simply uh, standard deviation plus two or minus two around a simple moving average of 20 or 50. You can get all the definitions for things like through Investopedia if you wanna uh, say what is RSI, what is percent B, what is MFI. Um, those definitions are available through Google, uh, it's, it's Investopedia, wherever you wanna find your information. Um, we do have a walkthrough tour uh, of the web screener uh, on written, so you can look up some of the other data points that we have to see what they mean. Um, let's see, so taking it from the top here, the first thing that's up here is streaks. Now, 
they're easiest to understand perhaps, but they're not necessarily the most advantaged because you could have a very small price change from one day to another, still qualifies as a streak, but doesn't give you much bang for your buck. So let's use it for an exercise right now. I'm just gonna take close to close streaks and I'm gonna take open to close output, meaning that the signal value is, is related to yesterday's close. And if this date here is uh, updated to the last trading day, um, then you know it's good to go. If you see that was still on August the 2nd, then the data wouldn't be updated. We're updating now within two hours after the close. Uh, sometimes it's a little bit faster than other times, but at least within two hours for sure. Um, and you know, then you can plan for the next trading day. So most subscribers would look at this and say, hey, I'm gonna screen for some ideas for tomorrow or for the next three days. So I've chosen close to close signal. Output is open to close. I'm using stocks. There's stocks pairs or stocks versus the SPY. USA feed, we've got different feeds in here. And the watch list, uh, I'm just uh, gonna say the S&P 100, okay? So we've got different watch lists here. And I can have a price range. I can have minimum volume. So if you're not on seasonality, just ignore this. Look back period, different look back periods. Don't worry about the bin size unless you get into the, the where we have statistical bins. So, so the streaks are not broken down into statistical bins. Um, we'll get to that in a minute. So the price range, you know, you can uncheck it or whatever. Just when you're dealing with this volume type, you have to check it and then you can choose shares or US dollars. US dollars can be very helpful for some of the small cap stuff and shares you know, is, is a good way. I've always run with shares, but uh, a lot of people like the US dollar turnover in the symbol. And then you put in, this is uh, MIO is millions. So you could do $150 million a day US dollars. Or if I wanted to do shares, I might put 1 million shares a day, that kind of thing. You can choose how many events. So you know, maybe you want that streak to have occurred a number of times minimum events, maybe three or whatever you want. And then you can explore that. So it brings up the symbols here and you can sort by any of the column headings. You can also change the column headings by clicking on column settings. These can be moved around any way you want. And uh, you, know, you can unclick one if you don't wanna see something like you don't wanna see historical volatility or something, you can unclick it. I like it set up this way. I like to see the symbol, the name, the industry, and the sector. I like to know both the industry and the sector so I can sort by that. Or I can focus on, you know what? I just want to be short oils. I really have a, a bias on being short them right now. And so I need to make sure I don't include on the long side something that might be in the oil patch. Uh, and I want to specifically focus on short those. So that's a personal bias. That's what I would do. I would, I would make sure I'm aware of the industry and the sector. Okay, and then whatever changes you make, make sure you save them. So we've got our screen here. You can click on anything and sort it by that as well. So if I, like I said, with sector, if I wanted to sort it by sector, I could. If I want to sort it by the number of streaks. So Starbucks, uh, was nobody drinking coffee anymore? It's streaked down six days in a row as of the close of yesterday. But the odds for today, open to close were favorable. There's been 10 events like that in our look back period of 2000 days. The average performance has been uh, 0.41 just for the day. That's not bad performance on average for the day. Sharp ratio is basically looking at it from a risk adjusted return if you were gonna be long. You want a, you want a positive sharp, you know, usually better than 10 or 15, 0 or 0.15. Um, you know, if you want to be long. Um, now the last performance was down. Obviously, it's been streaking down six days in a row. So, so we're coming off the back of a discount yesterday, which wasn't a bad trading day for the market. Yet Starbucks was down, um, and so it really probably got it out of its system, I would think. And then I like the maximum, uh, the uh, 
MFE, which is maximum favorable excursion, to be greater than the adverse excursion. So if we drill down at those 10 events, you can do that by clicking verify here. You can see each of the 10 events where it has streaked in the past. It did it in February of last year. In January of last year, 2017 and on, and then it just did it recently. So we don't know what the outcome will be this time, but we're, we're basically forecasting on a probability basis the outcome from what has happened. Now, if you wanted to export that to a CSV file there so you can study it more, you can, or you can close it back up. Okay? So we always have a resetting value before we start the streak. So it might have been going back and forth choppy. And, and so you have to start from uh, a perspective of it actually needs to move one full day in, in the same direction that it just did in order to qualify for number one. So it might actually be seven days in a row uh, down from that reset value, but uh, it's a streak, an actual verified streak of six days down on a close to close basis. So that could be, uh, you know, this is kind of that mean reverting concept as well. You know, something has been going down, it's discounted, you know, and I don't know what Starbucks is doing today. You know, we could look at it and say, okay, maybe maybe this isn't working out, or maybe it is working out really well. I don't know that at the moment. Uh, but uh, you know, this is this is by streaks. You can also sort by odds. So uh, you know, here we have Exxon. Odds of being up today are only 42.7. It had two streak two days in a row up. There's been 246 events, so obviously tons of events in the last 2,000 days. Average performance negative, shark negative, and so on. Gilead, MetLife, all of these have lower odds. You can sort by average performance and see if there's something that really pops up. Well, here's Facebook, down four days in a row. Odds of being up for today, open to close, 64.9, so better than 50. So you remember I mentioned to you how the dashboards work? The web screener is just slightly different in this, that it's based on we're looking for odds that are greater than 50 for our longs, and we're looking for odds that are less than 50 for our shorts. I also like, this is my choice, you guys can do it differently if you want, I also like the average performance expectancy to agree with that. So for Facebook, which was one of my long choices today, based on RSI and percent %B, um, not, I didn't look at streaks, but it's showing it, it's favorable on the streak side. You don't always have every single indicator agree. You could have a momentum indicator disagree with a standard deviation indicator. You could have an RSI disagree with your streaks. It's possible. And so you might choose to line up the ducks. You might want a complementary uh, signal where you, you searched and you said, okay, Facebook looks good here, how does it look elsewhere? And we're gonna look at that in a minute here. Um, so odds are 64.9, uh, better than 50, qualifies for a long candidate, average performance is good, sharp is good, uh, a, a favorable excursion, better than adverse excursion. And you know, I can drill down, there's the verification table again. So that could qualify for a long. Well, let's just check it based on our open to close output, but for different signals. So what I can do is I can type Facebook into this symbols feature, which is something we added. Again, this is another reason for updating our, uh, our, our tools, our help here, because uh, we've added features and we did actually remove some complicated things away. So it's a little bit simpler than it used to be too, but let's just save changes there. So now I'm only gonna search for Facebook. So let's go down to RSI2 and see how uh, Facebook responds. Odds, 63.0, there's been 100 events. Average performance, 0.36611, sharp is positive. So the RSI value, where it hit a low RSI of 9.41, that agrees with the streaks that we noticed. Now let's check the percent B, which is again related to standard deviation. 
and it doesn't agree. So of the three that we've looked at, two of them agree, one doesn't agree. So it's had 78 events into this lower Bollinger Band, you know, uh, where it is relative to Bollinger Band. And that, that particular Bollinger Band, you're kind of almost in the middle a little bit. So it's, um, it's not a super strong signal. So it's kind, of, it's kind of a flaky outcome for the next day. But we could look at, uh, you know, what's happened on an MFI, which is relative strength and a volume consideration. Let's explore that. Again, odds pop up to 60.7, 56 events, average performance is 46.17. So what, one helpful thing that I do, which I think will be great for you guys uh, as well, is let's say I um, go back to, maybe I start, maybe I start from a perspective of just, just moves that have occurred. Um, so I'll take close to close moves and I'm looking for open to close output. I'm going to explore that. Okay, so this is the price move and the subsequent odds. See, it says 56.6, average performance positive. Again, so we've only had one of the ducks disagree. The other ducks all line up that Facebook is a good long for today, right? Open to close from the open price of the market at 930 New York till 4 p.m. closing price, we're looking for Facebook to be up on the day on a probability basis. Now, the entire market could be completely tanked by the end of the day, pulling Facebook down with it, right? So this is one of the problems of stocks within a stock market. Now, if you had Facebook against the SPY, which it's a member of the S&P 100, so it does. Or if you had Facebook against Google, you might have a completely different outcome that on a relative basis, Facebook still outperforms Google or outperforms the SPY. So that's the main focus of what we do as career traders is to go, I want all my long selections to slightly outperform my short selections or my hedges, no matter which way the market goes, up, down, or sideways, it doesn't matter. So, you know, that's, that's, how, we, that's how we look at things. So I'm just gonna curate, I'm gonna take Facebook out of this for a second and curate a list. Let's explore this here. So this is move close to close, and it should bring up um, what's going on here. Oops. Still bringing up Facebook. Oh, sorry. Thought I deleted it here. Save changes. I got to remember to save changes. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, so we're going to bring up this list. I'm going to export it to a CSV file. Bring that up. Here we go. So I'll bring that one away. Oh, that's 68. So 63, 68. So this is the, the latest screen here that I just did. And you can see how it brings all of that information into a CSV file, which you can use within Excel to do whatever. Um, you know, if you're working with a CSV file, you know, you can you can eliminate like you know the bins and things like that, get them out of the way and just focus on you know, the majority of stuff that you want to do. You can put in, um, if you wanted to sort this, let's say by anything, you can just put in your filter, highlight the sheet and sort it by, you know, odds or something like that. So we'll sort from largest to smallest. So MasterCard, 3M, Oracle, Starbucks, Netflix, Texan, Amgen, Google. These are all uh, favorable for today. Amgen had news, by the way. So let's take, our top uh, 10 here. So I'm going to take those symbols. Now they all have favorable odds. The only one with uh, negative performance is MasterCard. So let's eliminate that one. I'm going to move it down and take uh, uh, to Gilead there. Okay. So the rest are all positive. So we have positive odds greater than 50. Average performance is all positive. Sharp's positive. Most likely, most of them are okay with favorable excursion versus adverse excursion. 
So we'll take those 10 there. Let's go back to our screener. And I'm just going to put those symbols into here and save them. So I'm looking for long candidates for today. And I got it from the price performance move. And now I want to compare it to how does it look on the RSI. And we get our list here. Okay. So of those candidates, um, we're looking at a conflict with uh, Amgen and so on. So let's uh, export that. So that's the list. Okay. And of that list, I want to highlight that and just sort again by odds. So we're looking at Visa, 3M, Starbucks, stuff like that, um, all the way down to here. So I'll take these three, or sorry, these seven, and I'll do it again. Back here, get rid of these symbols, put these symbols in here, save changes, and explore. Um, whoops, explore the same thing. I want to switch to percent %B. There we go. So those symbols on percent %B, and now you can see that Visa still comes out, Texan comes out, Starbucks comes out, Oracle comes out, Netflix, and 3M, Google will drop. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, great selections that have been confirmed through three different screens. Now, if you want something that's, this one's standard deviation, RSI's price performance. If you want to go to, you know, say a CCI, Commodity Channel Index, which is kind of like, again, standard deviation related, um, or stochastics or percent R, or maybe you want to use something completely different and you want to use a momentum three with open the close, we can do that as well. And we can see if the momentum side's holding up. And I might pull, you know, on that basis, I might pull 3M. Um, Starbucks has, you know, but it's, it's come out on top on so many other ones, so I'll probably leave it in. There's a little bit of a conflict on the momentum. So momentum would be a completely different approach than percent B, which is, you know, proximity to the Bollinger Bands. And it's not a bad idea to have, you know, a balanced approach to your indicators to say, okay, I'm not afraid of arguments against standard deviation. I'm not afraid of arguments against relative strength. It's, it's a good, healthy approach. Because at the end of the day, I just want the best longs that I can get. And especially over the, what the S&P is supposed to do. Now, if you want to take it to a, even a more advanced approach, you could look at stocks versus the pairs, right? So you could um, see how everything relates on that basis. I'm going to clear out my symbols. They are cleared. Okay. And th this is everything against the SPY. So what's beautiful about this, it gives you insights into the behavior of how the stock relates to the um, ETF that it's a member of. The SPY is a market cap weighted ETF. So how does, how does my stock relate to that ETF? How does Amazon relate to the SPY? And you can see that through these insights. So you can do the same thing. You can go through uh, screen after screen um, looking at these relationships. Just so you know, if you wanted to um, you know, use the symbols, I'll just show you a little trick here. So I export that to a CSV file. Um, and so you go and bring this up here and you've got your symbol name is including the spy, but here's the thing what you're going to do. You're not going to, you're not going to trade like 10 symbols and then all fraction of, of, of the ETF against it. You're probably going to look for 10 symbols that you can trade long and 10 symbols that you can trade short or some combination like that. So if you want to get rid of this spy, since it's the common, you can just go like this and uh, go uh, replace. So replace the forward slash spy with nothing. So that just took out, it just took the spy away from that. So it's easier to work with because you already know it's all against the spy. So then you can uh, sort by, you know, whatever you want, average performance. So let's see, 
So let's see how these things perform. Now everything is based on a ratio, so it's going to be a little bit different than when you're looking at the individual stocks on the other lists by themselves. Everything is ratioed. Uh, it's the symbol against the SPY. So that's why your last close is so you know uh, weird looking too. It's not like a thousand dollars. You know, it's not five hundred dollars for the last close. It's all the spread price of the one stock compared to the SPY. Okay. Um, so the the closer to one would be um, you know that they would be more similar in price, right? Okay. So McDonald's is still half as expensive as uh, the SPY is. Okay. This one here, Netflix, is similar to the SPY price. Um, but anyway, this is this is this gives you you know relative to the SPY. So if you wanted to take a McDonald's trade today and and hedge it with the SPY, you would need to be capital balanced. You'd need 200 shares of McDonald's to say 100 shares of the SPY. You could also look at it as a, a beta balanced approach. Um, you know, or historical volatility approach or ATR approach. There's different ways to position size, but just for capital balance, it'd be, you know, almost 200 shares of McDonald's to 100 shares of the SPY. Um, so very, very, very powerful uh, tools. Now, when I get new people to start on this and start playing around with, you know, long, short ideas, what I tend to have them do is go into pairs and under pairs is, is the components. So for example, um, you know, most of you are familiar with utilities and utilities are kind of a forgiving, you know, area to play around in. Now there are electric utilities, gas utilities and blended utilities. So you have to know a little bit about, you know, it's gonna be different if you have an electric utility against a gas utility, right? But let's just go and, and, and look through this. And so you can see that it's each symbol against the ETF, right? And you can see the odds. So this is where I get people to, to start. It's not, it's not an area you can make a, a huge amount of money because it's, it's very, uh, what would you call, efficient. It's, it's extremely efficient. Um, as they're all members of the XLU and there tends to be this sort of mean rever reverting action anyway that makes it very efficient, but it's a great place to start. So, you know, you're, you're working within the utilities, figure out which ones are electric, which ones are gas, and then just take odds on, say, peg long against, you know, maybe DTE short, you know, or um, SO uh, short versus you know, WEC long, whatever it is, just stay within the same sector and start to monitor your relationships and see how the odds are working for you. So again, you're not going to make as much money as when you open up the risk category to say, I'm going to go long some small cap stocks that have odds and I'm going to go short some big cap stuff that has, you know, lower odds you're either going to be really right, you know, or not so right. You're going to open it up to more risk because you're, you're, you're long, you know, a different capitalization stocks than you are short. But there are some days that that really pays off well when we're in a risk on environment, when, when people are really after the small caps and the sentiment is running high. Um, that activity can pay off very handsomely. You're still hedged. And in fact, you can be, some of those days, you could be making money on your long side and you're making money on your short side. Again, back to the relative strength argument, you really want the longs to outperform the shorts even if they all go up. Or you want your longs to be more defensive and hold up better than the shorts when the whole market goes down. And for side, sideways choppy markets or inside days, things like that, you want your longs to, to hold up really well against your shorts. And sometimes you can get that divergence where you make money on, on both sides of the equation. So just because, just because the odds show it to be favorable and the average performance favorable, 
and it does not work out for you when you take the trade doesn't mean that the database doesn't work because if the market dropped significantly it's pulling everything down with it so just keep that in mind that that over the long sample the statistical database has incredible insights powerful powerful insights into the behavior of stocks right over the long sample it has remarkable insights and that's and that's what we have to look at is how do i use those insights strategically how do i dig around in here and and you know find some 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 great uh concepts and and how do i develop strategies so in one sense we call these various uh signals we we call them strategies to some degree right it's a strategy or a signal i like to use you know both rsi and percent b because i like i like that tension between the two and i like when they agree and then when they disagree i might not use that in my trading right i might not pick that symbol up so um but some people love the momentum and and some people love the mfi which is kind of like price and volume uh so it's a little bit stronger perhaps than rsi it depends again what you like now your output you can choose open to close or close to open close to close close to close three days five days 10 days 20 days so this can be really great to get like what what did the statistics say about a signal and the subsequent behavior 20 days later so let's just put you know apple in there for example save changes i'll put it back on stocks whoops i think i i got to get rid of these because that's for the other one put apple in there okay so we've got apple loaded we're going to go to yeah move move close to close is fine and we're going to go out 20 days and we're going to explore apple so that's from the close of yesterday so going out 20 days odds are 68.5 there's been 92 events where it's fallen into that price move and uh, the average performance has been really good at 1.88 percent sharp ratio is healthy favorable excursion you know uh, more than the adverse excursion so again that's that's also re kind of reflected in why we have that sharp number um, and let's just flip through a few screens here rsi2 over 20 days still positive percent b for the next 20 days still positive uh, momentum i'll do a five period still positive so you know apple at the beginning of this month has come into favor and uh it's holding up you know better than it did it, like it i don't think it did very well and sort of may may even june some of the some of the time you know so it's a big cap stock i mean you know it has news on it every day but it's not like it's market moving type news it's just uh, you know and it's been used for a hedge uh, you know on the short side for a lot of things you know short apple let's buy a whole bunch of upcoming technology stocks right uh, but this is showing you that over 20 days um there's some there's some substance to this and that's what i'm these are the insights that i love is to find where i can sink my teeth into that you know that groundswell that that you know there's there's something behind this you know there's 53 events i can drill down and see how it's done and and kind of highlight any outliers i could even look back and say well was it because of earnings or or whatever i can look at these dates and see now just remember that all the news that occurs is kind of factored into our price performance and and our stats because whatever happens from whatever reason we're curating the the signal and the subsequent behavior okay so um i think i've covered everything here except for seasonality so seasonality is a little bit different on the web screener than the dashboard again because the dashboard's doing the work for you so we had one of our subscribers that asked me this morning um you know why the price was so different on aeo for the seasonality versus the um uh you know the uh the other screens that you do like rsi or percent b and that's because for seasonality you have to go back 
So that's so everything else works the way I said, including like even tech patterns and everything. You could look for a hammer or a U-turn, a reject high low, and you can you can see the subsequent behavior after the pattern, which is way better than just looking at a stock chart, thinking you, you know or trying to predict what's going to happen next. Go take a look at an actual pattern and see how often the pattern actually works. Sorry for me getting animated here, but but the patterns that you rely on, how do you know they work? Well, go see how often they work by looking at them through this lens here. Anyway, back to seasonality. Um, so we have to we have to focus in on, you know, let's say the the trading the trading day, okay, the trading day of the month. So I want let's say the first day of the month. I've got stocks. I've got. Uh, I'll do. Yeah, I'll just leave it S and P 100. And everything's based on close to close anyway, so you can just leave that. Um, now, do I want the trading day for all months, or do I want it for the same month? So if I choose the same month, now I need to go back because we haven't, as we were rolling into August. Well, let's let me let me flip it to something else here. Trading day. Let me say um, first Friday, because that hasn't happened yet. So that'll be a little clearer for you. The first Friday of August, we haven't had happen. It's going to be in three days, right? Two days, sorry. Uh, tomorrow and Friday. Okay. So first Friday hasn't happened. Now I need to go back on the calendar all the way until August of last year and look at the Friday. So remember, it's going to be from the close of the Thursday to the close of the Friday. And I explore that. So it'll tell you, it says first Friday of the month. So same month, first Friday, August, Apple has odds of 75. There's been eight events. So again, that kind of shows you how many months we're dealing with. So so that's last year. We don't have this year. So last year and then, and then uh, the previous seven years um, and that's been the average now here's the interesting thing even though the odds are being up the average performance is pretty benign sharp is benign so um, that's not like a this is collectively this isn't a strong indication of performance but for the next 20 days we know that Apple is performing pretty well so the odds are being up for the the 20 days it just happens that this particular Friday it's like eh, you know not much going on perhaps okay so that's how you get to these seasonality events. So this is different than anything else in, in the web screener. If I want to see, you know, what the performance is monthly, again, I have to choose, well, the monthly is the same month, and I can choose it on the calendar here. So we would go to the close of that month a year ago, and you would explore, and you could see how well it does for the month. So if you want to go to the day of the week, you have a choice of same month or all months. So again, you have to choose, you have to go back and say, okay, August, I want, you know, what happens on Wednesdays? We chose the Wednesday. So this tells you the third day of the week. There's been 32 weeks. Um, so again, we could go to all months. And we could look at what we have there. We have 409 events. So this is the third trading day of the week. And the average odds are up. Average performance is up. So, so over all the Wednesdays for all months, um, Apple has been performing really well. With this, with this, we could actually roll to um, more recently because we're choosing we're choosing a Wednesday, for example, which is what it is today. We'll have to roll back a week and look at there. Um, same thing, changes a little bit because I added, you know, eleven months to it. Changes slightly, so that's it's a little bit you know heavy lifting here when you get into seasonality. But um, again, use a combination of this and then you can check it against what you see on the seasonality dashboard it should agree if you're doing it right it should agree 
And so again, with the American Eagle example that I was asked about this morning, um, its price last year was only ten dollars and something. So it's it's over the this last year it's really risen. So any screens that we do in terms of like you know RSI right now are going to be based on um, you know where we are here in the calendar, which is Tuesday was the last trading day. So let's put in let's put in AEO and take a look here. So there's AEO. So um, its current price is 34.37, right? If we roll back to seasonality for this upcoming Friday, we would go down to seasonality here and be the first Friday that we'll choose. But again, I got to go back in the calendar to that first Friday and hit explore and you'll see the price is 1089. So it's moved from 1089 to where it is now uh, over the last year. So so that's kind of one of the problems is that you, you could have a lot of price change. So stuff like that might not be as reliable as you know the more recent, how has it been behaving in its most recent price range because volatility could change, things like that. Um, nonetheless, I look at things from, from all these lenses. Seasonality is my context. So for the first trading day of August and the last trading day of July, I use the web screener to output all the seasonality for those two days and then took those symbols that I wanted from that and put them into the RSI and the percent B and then compared notes. And then I took from that where all three sim all three signals agreed. So the seasonality and the RSI2 and the percent B all agreed. And that was that's robust performance um, when you kind of curate it that way. Okay. Now not again, you still have no guarantees. It's only probabilities, but statistically driven. So at the end of the day, how are you going to make decisions for the trading day? Some people do it discretionary. Some people have created some algorithms that trade for them. Uh, some people use a pairs approach. And some people use a basket approach. And, and basket is one of the most scalable uh, methods that I've ever seen to be able to use a, a, a lot of capital, but a small amount of capital per idea. And then it doesn't really matter if, you know, one of those trades doesn't work out or even if one has some, you know, outlier type performance up or down, it doesn't, you know, it impacts you slightly, but you don't have to like think about, well, I got to set my stop losses. I got to do this and that and the other thing because you're making it on the aggregate. So what's important is the quality of your expected performance for the long side against your short hedge that you choose to use or the short symbols that you use, you want those shorts to be underperforming the market. So as long as your longs are scheduled to, on a probability basis, to outperform the market and your shorts are scheduled to underperform the market, you kind of have a winning combination there. Okay, now I'm gonna open it up to questions. Um, let's see. So in order to in order to see uh, the pairs, um, you do have to subscribe to the the pro member. Um, please explain signal duration for pair trades. Um, so I'll, I can move to the pairs. So pair trades, you know, you have the same sort of thing. You can do them over multiple uh, time frames as well. Oops, we got seasonality still in here. Just remember this. I've made this mistake before too. Remember that if you do change back to look at seasonality, um, 
that you, you roll back to the most recent data date if you want to do other things. Otherwise, you're going to be still on the, uh, on the old date. And then you start searching around for other things, and you've brought in data uh, from the past. So what I tend to do is do the seasonality screen first, and then I make a conscious decision and effort to change the date before I do anything else. Okay. Um, Let's look at uh, RSI2, for example, on the pairs. So we have a number of, of pairs that you know have been related. Uh, they've shown some correlation and co-integration um, behavior. And you could do it the same way. Output is for the close of yesterday, August the 3rd, to the close three days from now. So it gives you your RSI value that this relationship hit and its odds, the number of events that have occurred where it fell into that uh, particular RSI bin, the bin of zero to five, and it's been a hundred events and the average performance, the sharp and so on. So you, you, you treat it you know, the same way as you do uh, individual stock, except that it, this is all curated based on the pair relationship, right? Same thing what you're doing with the components, the sector components. They're all paired against the sector ETF. So, for example, XLE, you know, look, at, it's excellent. I love, I love these relationships like Chevron against XLE. Well, Chevron's the, the second highest weighted stock in the XLE, right? Going to Exxon is the, the number one weighted stock in the uh, in the XLE. So to have this relationship, to have an RSI value on that relationship with the subsequent odds, you know, or choosing standard deviation, percent B, right? So to see how Exxon relates to the Bollinger Band, in that relationship. So again, you're taking the ratio spread and you're plotting it against all of these indicators and you can see the subsequent odds at number of events, average performance and sharp and so on. Does that answer your question? So uh, duration is simply the close of yesterday's activity where both stocks closed. And then you can go back, you can, you can go back and say, what would this have looked like back here on June the 8th, right? How did these relationships behave back then? And what happened? And you can go check and just say, you know, uh, by the way, um, if, if you guys want, I mean, uh, you've got Thinkorswim has pair charts, uh, eSignal, um, tradingview.com. You can even use it for free, but you, you get a little bit better value if you actually register but you don't have to pay for it um it's it's delayed data um you know daily data for trading view not a problem if you're looking at day to day activities for pairs or any other day to day activity you know real time charts are probably overrated unless you want to sit there in front of your screen all day and actually trade all the nuances and and movement but if you just want to you know, plan your trades the day before and take them the next day, let's say from the open to the close or something like that, uh, then there's no, uh, you know, need for minute by minute or tick by tick data. So tradingview.com has the ability to throw a pair in there. Now, the data that it's pulling from is, um, I think, bats or something. So it's not, uh, it's not every single trade, but again, the closing prices are all going to be, you know, relatively the same on all markets. N not exactly, but relatively. So again, you know, we want people to, to get started by experiencing, you know, the seasonality almanac, which um, it, seasonality is a very powerful thing for us. I showed you some examples of, of that already. Uh, it's it's really helps. There's so many different seasonal events, and um, we just wanted to give you a freemium offer that you could use all the time without any strings attached to it. And uh, 
it's a starting point, right? And if, if you really want to get value from all of the data, you need to consume the education and we're going to have more and more education coming out all the time. So just stay immersed in our ecosystem, reach out. Um, you know, I can help you if you're, you, you have questions, no problem. And just, uh, you know, realize that in order to use the data successfully, you need a framework, right? You have to have a framework to operate by. And so, you know, the framework is what is your daily workflow? You know, what goes into your decision-making process? Do you take your symbols and then put them into a, your news checker and check to see if there's any news that you should be aware of? Do you stay with those trades or do you remove them, right? Um, so one of my rules is, you know, if it's, if it's news that's sort of increasing the volatility beyond what I am, you know, wanting to engage with. Um, an example would be if it's, um, you know, some news that's, that's, that's potentially going to disrupt my, my boring as beautiful business as usual type plans, because that's where I really want to live is I want, I really want to live in signals and subsequent behavior in the business as usual category, not so much in this, Hey, it's got, you know, life changing news. It's got price discovery. Uh, it's never done that before in its history. Starting to get into those areas adds a lot more risk. That's probably unnecessary because what you want to do is you want to just make money on average. I talked to, uh, you know, I talked to one of my uh, top traders, uh, basket traders that's been with us uh, in, in my other firm for years. And uh, I just said, you know, like, what has your whole history of your trading been? And, um, you know, it's, it's come out exactly at 0.1% return on capital, um, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you do it, if you do that every single day on average, it really adds up. I mean, it's very scalable. And the, the problem that a lot of traders make is they go after the home runs, they go after the big gains, they go after the possibilities and the fear of missing out. And they end up maybe having a great day, which, you know, puts the hook in, it sets the hook in their jaw. So they're addicted to the, to the business now. They, they, they're like, oh man, I, you know, this is great. I can make a ton of money. And then, you know, they have a losing day, sure enough, one day that takes away a month's worth of work, two months worth of work, three months worth of work, or worse, keeps them from trading the next day because they lost way too much money. That type of disruption is hard on you, hard on your family, hard on you know the, a career approach. But rather, if you can take slow and steady wins the race, you know, compoundable gains, your account will grow and you're not going to damage your main tool, which is your trading capital. So there's nothing wrong with point one. I'm, I'm working at getting my personal benchmark from point one to point one five on average day after day. So uh, point one five to me is attainable, but it takes really digging into the in insights that the database provides and, you know, eliminating some of the conflicts like I showed you I showed you a, a, just a small insight into eliminating conflicts right like so if RSI and percent B are equally arguing with each other assume I have them equally weighted and they're both arguing one says take it long one says take it short well why do I have to be involved at all I don't need to trade that for the day I don't have to be involved in that I can't decide which is better but now if I had one of them that had three events and one of them had 300 events, my weighting would be naturally to the one that had 300 events. So that might be different. So these little insights you're going to discover for yourself. And, and we're here as a community to help you, you know, get the most out of the data, to get the most out of this uh, web screener. If you want to take it to more advanced, we have the API, which you can, all of this stuff is in the stock odds API that you can pull via HTML, uh, via um, CSV file, 
or JSON. So you you can you know you can decide how you want to pull that data, but you can consume all of these uh, data points here as well. One thing I forgot to mention is once you get something set up that you want to do day after day, go go save a screen of it, and you can you know whether it's percent B open to close or whatever, just save a screen of it. And that way you don't have to fill it in all the same and you make sure you don't make a mistake and miss something, okay? Uh, any more questions? So again, we have lots of uh, education for you to consume. That education is going to help you with general uh, market knowledge, best practices, uh, it's going to help you start to look at how to how to view the data and and how to uh, you know consume long and short ideas. We have some you know some great pair trading uh, knowledge and and I, and I find that a lot of people love to do pairs because it's understandable. Uh, how does Coke relate to Pepsi? Can I you know can I take odds on on Coke long and short Pepsi? You know what's What's it giving me in terms of opportunity here? Home Depot Lowe's, Walmart Target, all kinds of different combinations that just make sense. They're household names, things like that. But in order to know, you know what the opportunity is from open to close or close to close or close to close three days or longer, you, you, you really need that data support. And so you know, I invite you into the world of pairs. I invite you into the world of basket trading. And I know that you can, uh, you know, trade. Uh, the probability is that we increase your odds as as far as being successful because you're you're data informed, right? We have a slogan uh, that's borrowed from somebody that created it was, uh, you know, without data you're just another person with an opinion. And we hear so many opinions in the marketplace these days. TV's full of them. People are predicting where the market's going to be at the end of the year. Well, how do you know? Just walk, you know, really walk, walk humbly with and be and be very concerned when your mind starts to want to predict things that, uh, you know, you really can't uh, just be it's a seduction that people get into. So just be very careful. OK. All right. I think this is uh, long enough. Sorry for your hour and a half here, <laughs> but uh, we'll uh, we'll close it off. And um, thank you again for your attendance.